Okay, good evening, everyone. And thank you for joining us on our Estes lecture this evening, sponsored by the Boston Medical Library. Uh, a little bit of an introductory note to begin. Uh, the Boston Medical Library was founded in 1875 by James uh, Chadwick, a gynecologist in Boston, who was lamenting that uh, the books were not widely available for physicians. And um, he made books accessible through this. He, the first librarian of the organization was Oliver Wendell Holmes. And the organization continued uh, independently until 1960, when it combined with the Harvard Medical Library and uh, formed the Countway Library. Uh, this organization evolved to have a very large and priceless collection of antique medical books, including hundreds of incunabula, which are books printed uh, between uh, 1440 and 1500. It also contributes to the Center for the History of Medicine at Countway, as well as sponsoring various events, including this lecture. Jay Worth Estes uh, was a professor of pharmacology at Boston University School of Medicine, as well as an accomplished medical historian. He served as editor of the Journal of the History of Medicine and Allied Sciences, as well as authoring several books on the topic. And this lecture was established in the year of his death to honor his memory. I'd like to thank my colleagues on the Estes Lecture Selection Committee uh, for all of their help and creative input. I'd also like to thank Tara Peeler, our assistant, for all of her work to organize this meeting. So this evening, we are lucky to have David Jones uh, as our speaker. This is actually the second Estes Lecture that he has delivered. Uh, Dr. Jones is the Ackerman Professor of the Culture of Medicine um, at Harvard uh, Medical School. Uh, his article on the history of epidemics in the New England Journal of Medicine garnered over 500,000 views and has been cited 55 times just since March when it first appeared. And to put this in context, uh, the average article uh, gets about 30 to 50,000 views in the New England Journal. So this is uh, really uh, a popular article and we are so fortunate to have Dr. Jones with us this evening. Thank you. Take it over, David. Okay, so that should put my <clears throat> slides up. It's, it's a real privilege for me to give this lecture. I was looking back and thinking of how long I have been using the collections of the, of the Boston Medical Library and of Cantway itself. And I think the first time I set foot in that library uh, was as a high school student back in 1987. And I have been a happy and satisfied user of that library ever since. And one of my great regrets of the COVID, COVID epidemic is that it's currently inaccessible to us in the usual fashion. Uh, but the staff there have done heroic work to do so much to make their collections available to us despite the epidemic that it's still possible to get a lot of work done as a historian of medicine. And I'm very grateful for the efforts of the staff at both the Boston Medical Library and the Harvard Medical Libraries working to, to get together at Countway. <clears throat> now, even though the libraries are working well, most of us are living in a state of anxiety in September 2020. In part, this is because of the serious ongoing problems that we have with COVID and unemployment, especially in Massachusetts. Many people are anxious about the presidential election. And in part, people are worried because they fear a repeat of what, will hap of, of what happened a century ago. Boston in September 1918 was an anxious place as it is today, because in that month, war, baseball, and a pandemic had all converged on the city. The war had started first. The United States entered World War I in 1917 and worked to field an army to send to Europe. Many physicians in Boston, especially from Mass General Hospital, as, as well as nurses, staffed military hospitals in France. One of the hospitals was Base Hospital 6 in Bordeaux, where the medical service was led by Richard Cabot and included Paul Dudley White, who has left us this hand-drawn map of the, the Army Hospital that, where he worked. An outbreak of influenza had started during this mobilization. It first appeared at Fort Riley in Kansas in March 1918 and caused several hundred cases. U.S. soldiers carried the virus to Europe, and there were outbreaks in France and Germany by April. Now, there were continuing outbreaks, small outbreaks, in the United States over the summer, but because of wartime censorship, news of this outbreak was suppressed. News was suppressed everywhere, except in Spain, and as a result, the epidemic came to be known as Spanish flu and not Kansas flu, which would have been a much more deserving moniker since the epidemic really had begun in Kansas. 
The baseball season also got underway despite the war and despite the influenza in the spring of 1918. The season, however, was soon disrupted. The government issued a work or fight rule. All able-bodied men needed to enlist in the army or work in an essential job. Baseball managed to be granted an, ex an extension, was deemed essential enough until the end of the season in September of 1918. But even though they had this ex exception, many players still left to join the war effort. Teams had to scramble to fill holes in their rosters. The manager of the Red Sox allowed his best pitcher, Babe Ruth, to try his hand at batting. Ruth soon led the major leagues with 11 home runs that season. The regular season ended on Labor Day, September 2nd, with the Red Sox narrowly, narrowly, narrowly winning the American League pennant. They traveled to Chicago that first week of September for the first three games of the World Series against the Cubs. Influenza, meanwhile, had come back. In August 28th, there were the first reports of cases among sailors at the naval base in Boston. Within a week, there were several dozen cases. The military tried to keep everything quiet, explaining that this was just a normal cold, a normal flu, and not the Spanish flu that seemed to be causing so much trouble in Europe. But on September 8th, it struck Fort Devens, a base that housed 50,000 soldiers. It also spread more widely in the naval facilities in downtown Boston. On September 10th, the military had to open a tent hospital in the open spaces in Brookline. Public gatherings were allowed to continue, especially rallies and parades in support of the troops and the World Series. The World Series returned to Boston for game four on September 9th. Babe Ruth, who had won and pitched game one, also won game four as well, pitching 16 scoreless innings in the World Series. The Red Sox went on to win game six on September 11th. Now, as many of you know, this was the last time the Red Sox would win the World Series until 2004. But it was a depressing affair. All the way through the World Series, the players had been angry about a dispute with the owners about pay. Part of the problem was that between the war and the flu, not as many, not as many uh, fans were coming to the games. And so the share of the take that the players were su supposed to get was lower than they had wanted. When the game ended, players and fans walked out of the stadium without any celebration at all. That night, the first cases of flu were reported in the civilian population. They overshadowed what otherwise would have been good news from France. On September 12th, the US Army launched its first combat operations in France, led by the Yankee Division, made up of soldiers from Massachusetts. By the next day, they had won a major victory against a well-defended German position at saint Mahil. This made people hope that the end of the war would be in sight. Nonetheless, many troops continued to pass through the city en route to Europe. The news about flu soon turned worse. Within a week, there were hundreds of cases in the civilian population, thousands amongst the soldiers and sailors. Boston City Hospital and MGH were both overwhelmed. Their morgues were overflowing. Officials at hospitals denied rumors the doctors and nurses were falling sick. But they could only keep the news quiet for so long. Finally, on September 17th, the Boston Globe broke the story and acknowledged that there was a flu pandemic in Boston. Health officials continued to insist that the epidemic was under control, that there was nothing to worry about, that it would soon just disappear. Instead, cases doubled by the end of the month. The city finally mobilized in the end of, end of September with school closures, bans on public gatherings, but it was too late. 20% of the population of Boston would be infected and 5,000 would die. This was the start of the second wave of influenza that would go on to kill 675,000 people in the United States that year. This history has left those of us who know it feeling a bit of dread. Will history repeat itself this fall? Will there be a second wave like there was with influenza in 1918? That question itself raises a fundamental question for historians of medicine. What lessons can we learn from the history of past epidemics? Can we make useful analogies between past and present that can offer guidance for us today? Now this interest in analogs has made the history of epidemics a topic of newfound interest amongst journalists, policymakers, and the public more widely. It has also become a topic of serious debate amongst historians. <clears throat> in this talk, I will review some of the lessons that historians have attempted to draw from this epidemic and discuss the debates behind these. Why is it that it has become controversial to claim that you can learn lessons from this history? <clears throat> 
And then since we're now six months into the epidemic itself and the epidemic has its own history, I'll describe in retrospect some regrets I have about certain things that I wish historians had done better back in February and March in the early months of this epidemic. And then I'll finish with a few thoughts. Uh, I'm very wary about prediction at this point, but I'll finish with a few thoughts about what might happen this fall. Now there had been a time not too long ago when historians were among the very few people who were interested in the history of epidemics. In part, this was because epidemics, until last spring at least, were seen as by many as a thing of the past. With the rise of antibiotics and immunizations in the 1950s and 1960s, physicians and public health officials were confident that they had conquered infectious disease. Abdel Omran's 1971 theory of the epidemiological transition promised linear progress. Societies had moved from an age of pestilence and famine to the age of receding pandemics. And once we had reached the age of degenerative and man-made man disease, there would be no going back. In 1972, virologist and Nobel laureate McFarlane Burnett captured a widely shared sentiment. As he wrote, the most likely forecast about the future of infectious diseases is that it will be very dull. Yes, he admitted there was some risk of some wholly unexpected emergence of a new and dangerous infectious disease, but nothing of the sort has marked the last 50 years. Now the sense of conquest clearly wasn't true. As my boss, Paul Farmer, frequently reminds me, this vision of a triumph over infectious disease was incredibly narrow-minded. If it was true, it was only true in wealthy countries. Most of the world continued to suffer from pestilence and famine alongside the diseases of modern life. And even as these men in the 1970s wrote about the conquest of infectious disease, a series of new or re-emerging infections were shattering medical complacency. Herpes, Legionnaire's disease, and Ebola in the 1970s, AIDS in the 1980s, and then Lyme disease, West Nile, SARS, and of course, now COVID. Now, these outbreaks did direct some attention to the problem of preparedness. For instance, some of you might remember in 2006, the Bush administration uh, released a national plan for flu pandemics. They developed a national stockpile, which actually started by the Clinton administration, so we would have supplies on hand should an epidemic strike. But none of these efforts led to adequate investments. As historian Andrew Lakoff has described, we were seriously unprepared. We had underfunded public health systems for decades, leaving them much less equipped than they had been in the past. Modern hospitals are tuned to man manage the usual burden of disease as efficiently as possible. Hospitals want to run close to 95% capacity, otherwise they lose money. None of them wanted to build or staff the excess capacity that an epidemic, epidemic would require. And meanwhile, many changes in society continue to increase our risk for a major epidemic, whether that was industrialized agriculture, urban crowding, increasingly easy air travel, income inequality, or systemat systemic racism. Now the government had done a series of pandemic sim simulations as recently as a year ago. The scenarios were hauntingly similar to what has happened with COVID, a new respiratory virus emerging out of Southeast Asia wrecking havoc. The mos this most recent one, Crimson Contagion, had highlighted a long series of de deficiencies in government planning and capabilities that ought to be addressed before we would be adequately prepared. But as best as journalists can tell, this report doesn't seem to have prompted any kind of government action last fall or last winter. And now we are in part living in the consequence of this. Now, even though many people had ignored the history of epidemics and thought that was a thing of the past, historians of medicine have long been fascinated by this history. Epidemics pr provide remarkable opportunities for studying social dynamics and social values of societies under crisis. One of the most influential accounts was produced by my colleague, Charles Rosenberg, who described the dramatic structure of an epidemic. Inspired by the work of Albert Camus, Rosenberg wrote that the earliest sign signs of an epidemic are subtle, whether influenced by a desire for self-reassurance or a need to protect economic interests, citizens often ignore clues that something has gone awry until the acceleration of illness and death forces reluctant acknowledgement of the epidemic. Recognition launches the second act in which people demand and offer explanations, both mechanistic and moral. The explanations in turn generate public responses. 
These responses can make the third act as dramatic and disruptive as the disease itself. Epidemics eventually resolve, whether succumbing to societal action or having exhausted the supply of susceptible victims. In the aftermath of an epidemic, there is usually a brief moment of retrospection and a promise for reform, but all too quickly this gives, gives way to complacency or even forgetting that anything had ever happened. Now that we are almost a year into the COVID crisis, it is easy to map the epidemic onto Rosenberg's framework. It is still not clear when the virus first began to spread amongst humans. Reports circulated beyond China around New Year's. The first known case came to the United States on January 15th and was diagnosed on January 20th. Though now people have been looking for earlier signs and there's some evidence, not conclusive, but there's some evidence that COVID might have been circulating in California by last November or last December. The first case in Massachusetts was diagnosed in late January in someone who had traveled from Wuhan. The second case came in late February, and then soon there were more with the now infamous Biogen conference. But state officials, as you can see in these early press releases, continued to downplay the risk, saying there's nothing for us in Massachusetts to be concerned about. Public health officials were confident that this would not cause us any trouble at all. Now, in retrospect, President Trump has been furiously criticized for denying the threat of the epidemic. Some have even accused him of lying to the public while he says he was simply trying to be calm and reassuring. But he was not the only person who responded to the early warnings with denial. Most of us did know better. Many of us spent January and February hearing about the reports in China, then Iran, and then Italy, and did not think that anything bad would come of it here. I certainly spent those months uninterested in what was happening, assuming that this was another false alarm as had happened with influenza in 2006 and 2009. In this respect, we were like the citizens of Iran described back by Camus in the plague, who noticed the signs that the rats were dying and failed to make the connection that maybe plague was at work in the city. Humans have often demonstrated a remarkable ability to see the clues of an epidemic but not recognize their significance. Now, once the threat was recognized, and for most of us in Boston that happened in the second week of March, we entered Act Two, efforts to explain the epidemic and understand what was happening. Here, we also followed the script pretty well. The medical explanation was easy. Chinese officials had moved very quickly to identify and characterize the new RNA virus, and even had published a sequence of the virus before the virus was circulating widely in other parts of the country or the rest of the world. Since the cause of this new outbreak was clear, it allowed the rest of us to move quickly onto questions of blame and responsibility, and these have gone far and wide. President Trump has blamed China and the World Health Organization. Many others have blamed the governors in Florida or Texas or Arizona or California who were slow to do everything possible that could have been done to slow this epidemic. Many others have blamed the Centers for Disease Control, whether for the failure to implement adequate testing last winter or for allowing the politicization of its guidelines and recommendations. Now, so far, we have had to fight this epidemic in the absence of powerful scientific techniques. We don't have a vaccine yet. Russians and Chinese have promising things, but remains to be seen if those will work well. And we don't have a powerful uh, antiviral medication. Remdesivir helps some patients, but it still leaves a lot to be desired. In the absence of powerful biomedical interventions, we've been forced to turn to history for inspiration. And so luckily, this is a case where the history of flu had inspired research that has been quite useful for us. In 2007, for instance, two teams of scholars, including epidemiologists and historians, had analyzed what happened in 1918 with influenza, looking carefully city by city to see what kinds of interventions had been implemented and whether or not any of those had an effect. Both of these analyses, independently in parallel, showed that non-pharmaceutical interventions, especially social distancing, could flatten the curve and reduce mortality. The whole world has now tried to put this historical insight into action with highly variable success. Uh, the US likely least successfully of all, although India and Brazil 
are giving us a run for the money there. People are now waiting uh, for signs of decisive success and an eventual end of the epidemic. <laughs> the classic epidemic has a single rise and fall. The crisis creates, stimulates a response that brings things under control. Or the epidemic runs its course. It runs out of victims and fades away, a process known as herd immunity. Now, one of the fresh, my frustrations is that historians have not studied the end game of epidemics as carefully as they have studied other aspects. In May, the New York Times reporter Gina Collada uh, interviewed a who's who of historians of medicine in the United States about this question of how epidemics end. Uh, and many of us had a little specific guidance because our historical knowledge of the end game of an epidemic is much thinner than it is of other aspects of epidemics. I suspect that will now change. Many of the people who she interviewed here are now busily doing studies of the end of epidemics in hope of gaining insight into what we can expect over the coming months. Part of the problem here is that COVID has not followed a simple trajectory, at least not in the United States. Even as it completed an initial cycle of rise and fall in New York and then Massachusetts in April and May, and you can see those curves in yellow on the right, it began to rise later in other parts of the country. Florida, Texas, Arizona, and California were, were hit hardest in June and July. Taken together, if you add the trajectories in all of these 50 states, it creates the, the familiar double peak of the epidemic that you can see on the graph at the bottom that we are now all familiar with. <clears throat> but what that, that's a composite of the single waves that most regions have gone through, leaving many of us wondering, uh, will a second wave come in New York or Massachusetts or other places? Now, despite that ambiguity, many of us believe that it is uncanny how well our experience of COVID mirrors what was described by Rosenberg or Camus decades ago. But attempts to draw deeper lessons from this history of epidemics have been more controversial. One of the first things that historians will do is try to draw parallels between current and past epidemics in hopes of gaining insight from the analogies. This was done often when HIV first struck in the 1980s. Different historians made arguments about which disease provided the best precedent, whether syphilis, cholera, tuberculosis, or plague. My advisor, Alan Brandt, I think made the most convincing case that syphilis was really the best analog for HIV for a variety of reasons that make very good sense. They're, they're both in part or primarily sexually transmitted infections. So when historians began to pay attention to COVID in February, then March of last winter, they often did the same thing. I remember having many discussions with my colleagues about whether COVID would be more like SARS or flu. SARS was the hopeful analogy. When it struck in 2003 and 2004, it was quickly controlled with just 774 deaths over nine months. Flu could have been either in an ominous or a reassuring comparison, depending on which epidemic of flu you used. Some compared it to flu in 2009, when the World Health Organization declared a pandemic that turned out to be no worse than the usual seasonal flu, and many hoped that would be the case with COVID. Others warned that COVID might be like 1918, the notorious pandemic that had killed 40 million people worldwide. But as soon as some historians started looking to make analogies to past epidemics, other historians criticized this approach. The course of an epidemic depends on the details of the society that it strikes. Since societies change in significant ways over time, simple analogies can be very misleading. Historian of medicine Robert Peckham, who observed the outbreak of COVID from his post at the University of Hong Kong, and having written a previous book about the history of epidemics in East Asia, wrote in the journal Lancet about what he called the anti-lessons of history. He argued that even a simple comparison, for instance, COVID in Hong Kong in 2020 compared to SARS in Hong Kong in 2004 was a risk. Hong Kong had changed dramatically between 2004 and 2020, and historians needed to avoid making false analogies between past and present. Later that month, in the end of March, two French historians pushed this even further. They criticized historians who tried to define universal features of epidemics. As they wrote, embroidering the present crisis into a quasi-mythical structure of panic and quarantine has the effect of smoothing over the intricate historicity of pandemic events. Historians need to resist the comforts of comparison and instead focus on analyzing 
each outbreak as a unique event tied to the specific, specific contexts in which it occurred. Now, I am sympathetic to those concerns. Yes, of course, context matters enormously. Every epidemic in every city will have its own unique important details. But I still think there are important lessons that can be learned from the history of epidemics. And looking back now, six months into our lockdown in Massachusetts, my current thinking is that historians did not do enough last March to recognize and apply the lessons of history. Let me give you three examples about our power to shape epidemics, about race, and about the politics of epidemics. Now, the first relates to the problem of an allergy. As I said, when the epidemic spread in February, or came, rose to attention in February, the classic question was, would COVID be like SARS or flu? These discussions often focused on specific questions. Would you become contagious before or after you developed symptoms? This determines how effective a quarantine can be. So with SARS, you become symptomatic first. And so as long as you stop people from, with fevers from traveling, you can easily contain the spread of SARS. With flu, it's not that way. With flu, you become contagious before you become symptomatic so flu is a disease that proves very hard to quarantine. So everyone hoped that COVID would be more like SARS, another coronavirus than flu. That turned out not to be the case. As we now know well, uh, it's very possible for people who are asymptomatic to transmit COVID. People also sp spent a lot of time talking about what's called the reproductive number or r not, the average number of new infections started by each person who is sick. This is a measure of how contagious a virus is. And so many people tried to figure out in those weeks of February and early March, what was the r naught of COVID? Was it extremely high, like with measles? Was it low, like with HIV? Where would it fall on that spectrum? Or they wanted to know what was the case fatality rate? If you got sick, how likely was it that you would die? In each of these cases, the effort was made to figure out a specific feature of the virus. But in retrospect, this was too simplistic of an approach. It focused too much on the pathogen and the assumption that the virus itself had fixed characteristics. But if there's anything that history has taught us about epidemics, it is that social context determines the course of epidemics. AIDS followed radically different course in New York or in Tennessee or in Sub-Saharan Africa or India in terms of almost everything, in terms of the mode of transmission, in terms of the opportunistic infections, in terms of oxys to care, in terms of how long you could, would be able to live if you were infected with the virus. And as you can see from the very different country plots of the COVID epidemic, there's been incredible diversity in how different countries have responded to this virus as well. There is no single r not or case fatality rate for HIV or for COVID. It all depends on what we do. This has been very demonstrated very well by how different the epidemic has been in the United States or in Canada or Iceland or Vietnam. Instead of wondering whether, I, whether COVID would be like flu or like SARS, or instead of wondering what the r not of COVID would be, I wish we had been more self-conscious about our power to shape the course of the epidemic. Had we done so, we might have acted earlier and in more decisive ways. My second question is the problem of race. Now, Charles Rosenberg and other historians have long argued that epidemics function as stress tests. They reveal the latent structures in societies, exposing what and whom people in a society truly value. Now, historical analysis of past epidemics has often revealed a, per revealed a persistent pattern. Epidemics, like other disasters, almost always take their greatest toll on the most vulnerable people in a population, especially the poor, or minorities or people who are otherwise marginalized. You can see this clearly with cholera or tuberculosis in, the, in New York City in the 19th century. You can see this with plague in San Francisco in the 1900s. And you can see it with AIDS and all other epidemics since that time. When COVID rose to attention in February, scholars in history, epidemiology, anthropology, or the social sciences knew all that we needed to know to make a prediction that COVID would hit poor minority communities the hardest. 
As far as I can tell, none of us did. There were certainly some discussions on online communities about structural violence and the ways in which COVID would expose inequities in society. And there was lots of discussion about the anti-Chinese tropes that showed up in American media in response to this epidemic. But as far as I can tell, and this, I haven't been able to complete this research in an exhaustive way, there were not people coming out and saying, if this hits, it's gonna hit certain people harder than others, and we need to do more. By late February or early March, there were efforts amongst activists to mobilize, but by that point, it was, may have been too late to dramatically alter the course of the epidemic. Much more could have been done earlier in the epidemic, and had we done so, it is possible that attention and resources would have been mobilized earlier that would have prevented the dire toll that this epidemic has taken on the most poor and most vulnerable people in society. And the case that bugs me the most, because this is where my early research had been, was in the epidemic of COVID that hit the Navajo reservation. I remember when news of that broke, people were thinking, it doesn't make sense that COVID would hit the Navajo reservation. This is a population living in rural poverty with very low population density. There aren't many people jumping on planes and on airports in the Navajo reservation and flying back and forth to Italy or China. The Navajo seemed like they should have been low risk. No one expected the virus to strike there. But exactly the same arguments had been made about tuberculosis in the early 20th century. When people were consumed by tuberculosis in the eastern cities, especially Boston, New York, and Philadelphia, they often sent their patients to the southwest to convalesce and to recover from this epidemic. No one thought that it was possible that tuberculosis would thrive amongst people living in rural poverty and low population density. But they soon realized that tuberculosis had called, caused appalling mortality amongst the Navajo people. And a large section of the first book I wrote documented the ways in which people were surprised and ignored this tuberculosis epidemic on the Navajo reservation. And exactly the same dynamic played out uh, with COVID. And I'm quite chagrined that it hadn't occurred to me earlier in the course of the epidemic to warn that something similar to tuberculosis would happen with COVID, which indeed was the, how history played out. And as a result, Many people seem surprised on April 3rd when ProPublica first broke the, what I think is the least surprising news of the epidemic, that race disparities existed with COVID. In the case of Milwaukee, the African Americans comprised 26% of the population, but 50% of the early cases and 81% of the early deaths. And similar reports soon emerged from just about everywhere in this country. And this has now become one of the defining features of this epidemic. Now, I'm not delusional, had historians warned that minority groups in the urban poor would be most at risk from COVID, I don't think the country would have solved the problems of poverty and racism between February and March and aborted this epidemic. But I do think perhaps things could have been handled better had people been more aggressive about making these warnings earlier in the course of the epidemic. And this brings me to the third lesson that I think we failed to learn, the issue of leadership in an epidemic. And this involves a bit of an apology by me. So when I first wrote about COVID in early March, this, the article that Dale mentioned has been viewed 500,000 times, I downplayed the risk. Uh, and now my bad prediction has been read by 500,000 people. Uh, when I was writing in the first week of March, China had controlled the outbreak. There were fewer than 5,000 deaths worldwide. There had been no deaths in Massachusetts and just that seemingly small outbreak at Biogen. I was confident, I had faith, that Massachusetts and the rest of the United States would contain the outbreak well. I argued that we really needed to keep our attention on the big pillars in this country, heart disease and cancer, and I was worried that we would overreact to COVID. Specifically, I was concerned that the policies that we would adopt, social distancing, closing down aspects of the economy, might do more harm than the epidemic itself. Yes, we might flatten the curve of COVID, but at the cost of high unemployment, poverty, and domestic violence. I was worried that the response would be worse than the disease itself. I was a bit dismayed when that argument started to circulate first in Fox News and then in the words of Donald Trump, who tweet shouted on March 22nd, we cannot let the cure be worse than the problem itself. And I hope he got this idea himself and not from my article. <laughs> 
And I have now spent a lot of time wondering why I and many others in March underestimated COVID. I think my simplest excuse, and it's not something I'm ashamed of, is that my, I had too much faith uh, in how the United States would respond. I assumed that the centers of disease control and political leaders would orchestrate a successful response to this epidemic. That made sense to me at this time, at that time. After all, the US uh, had a very well-funded healthcare system. The Centers for Disease Control was, was the pride and joy of the federal government. And I assumed that they would handle this well. But now looking back six months later, as a historian, I cannot understand why I was so confident about this. A historian of epidemics in the United States ought reasonably to have pre predicted that we would bungle this epidemic. If there is any lesson that should be drawn from the history of epidemics in the United States, it is that our response to epidemics are often far less effective than they could be. Historians, myself included, have written countless examples of botched epidemic responses. Smallpox vaccination was described in 1798, but it took us 108 years to mobilize the political will to eradicate the virus. AIDS could have been stopped in the early 1980s. We knew all that we needed to know, but it wasn't. Antiretroviral therapy could stop AIDS now. It has led to dramatic progress against the disease, but only a partial success. We have many, many tools that we do not implement to their fullest potential. And epidemics in the United States have always become politicized. As Marty Pernick described in the 1970s, an epidemic of yellow fever in 1793 became one of the first partisan fights in US history and was a major factor in the creation of the two-party system in Philadelphia that we all know and love today. And there have been similar, describes of, similar descriptions of highly politicized outbreaks ever since in all parts of this country. And this politicization often compromises the effective response to the epidemics. It may be the case that the failures by many governors, by the CDC, or by President Trump may be extreme, but they are the same sort of things that we have done countless times before. And so for the life of me, I can't understand why back in March I had faith that our government would respond perfectly to COVID when that is not usually what we had done in the past. So where do things stand now? Uh, for a historian of medicine looking on the long sweep of epidemic history, COVID is still a small player on the great stage of the history of epidemics. There are these gargantuan epidemics that loom in the past, or not past, AIDS, but flu 1918, plague in the 14th century, epidemics before that, which killed far more people as best as we can tell than COVID has done. Getting close to a million deaths worldwide, that's still a far cry from the 40 million deaths of AIDS or pandemic flu. Meanwhile, within the United States, COVID has been climbing relentlessly up the ranking of causes of death in the United States. It is now at number three, uh, approaching 200,000 deaths. I assume that will pass it in the next week or so. Some have predicted a total of 400,000 deaths, still won't be as high as cancer or heart disease, uh, but it is still an appalling toll especially since it seems like many of these deaths could have been prevented had we responded differently. So if this is the situation now, what can we expect going forward? There has been a long history of predictions during this epidemic. In February, my colleague at the Harvard School of Public Health, Mark Lipsitch, predicted that 40 to 70% of the world's population would be infected within a year. I suspect that will prove to be a high estimate. You know, it could be that we're at about 10% now. It's very hard to tell because the testing hasn't been what we want it to be. And if we don't end up reaching that prediction of 40 to 70%, I suspect Mark would say that's because societies, many, most societies implemented very good controls that affected the course of the epidemic. Now in April, he and several other colleagues offered an updated forecast of possible scenarios that made use of this imagery of waves. They thought there were three different things that could happen. You could have a series of oscillating outbreaks where the virus would come, we would implement social distancing, the virus would go down, we would relax social distancing, the virus would come back. Someone thought there might be a monster wave, that's the 1918 flu pandemic scenario, or some people thought there would just be a persistent and ro rolling crisis as 
societies responded inadequately to this crisis. And some of you re may remember back in June, Tony Fauci and Vice President Mike Pence offered competing predictions. Uh, Pence tried to reassure the country that there was no second wave. Uh, this was despite the fact that the epidemic was growing quickly in the South and the West. And Fauci was saying, this is all still part of the first wave. Hold on to your hats. A second wave might still come in the fall. Now, this language of waves isn't surprising. Epidemiologists and historians have long used waves to describe epidemics, most famously with flu in 1918, which famously struck in three waves from the spring of 19 into the, 1918 into the spring of 1919. And this isn't just epidemiologists looking back. The imagery and language of waves was also used at the time in 1918. But one of the troubles with these wave scenarios is while it's possible to predict the kinds of scenarios that could happen, oscillations, a giant wave, it is much harder to predict what kind of scenario actually will happen. And again, as many people have argued, both historians and epidemiologists like Mark Lipsitch, this is because epidemics are not some irresistible force. They do respond to decisive human action. What we do now will determine our future experience of COVID. Unfortunately, what we did or didn't do or in the summer is what's determining our current experience with COVID. Now, for a variety of reasons over the summer, many epi epidemiologists began to move away from the language of waves and began to write more about forest fires. Uh, and this language actually preceded the catastrophic outbreak of forest fires in California and Oregon that are happening right now. So I first encountered this back in May uh, in a conversation with Mark Lipsitch about wave imagery. I had asked him about wave metaphors, and he explained that he preferred the imagery of fires. Waves propagate and dissipate. Epidemics, however, like forest fires, can grow exponentially. As he argued, epidemics are more like forest fires in the sense that if dry wood susceptibles are there, any spark can, can start the process again. You don't need a major input of energy to start a forest fire as you do with a wave. You just need that single spark and a population of susceptible people. And this language soon became more widespread. When Trump had his rally in Tulsa on June 20th, he said that the problem with the COVID epidemic was that there was too much testing. And if we just stopped testing, the epidemic would go away. Mark's colleague and collaborator, Michael Osterholm, went on Meet the Press the next morning and pushed back. As he explained, I think this is more like a forest fire. Wherever there's wood to burn, this fire is going to burn. And I can certainly understand the rhetorical appeal of the language of forest fires. It's dramatic, it's frightening. It might inspire people to take the problem more seriously. But I do worry that this imagery of forest fires again implies that an epidemic is a natural disaster that will simply run its course wherever there are susceptible people. As historians and epidemiologists know, epidemics are not invisible. We are not passive victims. While history suggests that we are at risk of bungling the response, history has also taught us what we need to do if we want to control epidemics. So given this, what can we predict about the fall in light of what happened in 1918? Now this fall, I hope that we will have no world wars to fight. There's no evidence of, yet, of that yet, but everyone, Trump himself included, is predicting that this will be a particularly bloody presidential campaign. My best prediction is that there will be a World Series and the Red Sox are not going to win it this time around. I hope and expect that we will produce vaccines, but I also predict that they will be less effective than we want them to be. There are a variety of reasons why it's very difficult to produce vaccines against coronaviruses. And I'm quite confident that there will be vigorous debates about how to distribute the vaccine and backlash from anti-vaxxers, much of which has already started in this country. There have been protests in many parts of the country, even in Boston, about compulsory vaccination, either for flu or for COVID. But what about the key question? Will there be a second wave of COVID? Or worse yet, will there be a twindemic in which COVID and flu together wreak havoc in tandem? I simply do not know. Too much of that depends on how our response unfolds. We live in a society that creates all sorts of risks for epidemics, global travel, industrial agriculture, persistent racism, and dramatic 
economic inequality. Whether or not COVID comes back in a second wave this fall, other epidemics will certainly strike as they have always done. This will happen until we make investments in human capital and social equity that could, once and for all, reduce our risk of these epidemics. Societies have tremendous power to contain and control epidemics, but we still have to decide whether or not we want to do that. I'm guardedly hopeful, but I think too much remains unknown to see what will happen this fall. And so I, I think with the rest of you, we'll be spending a very anxious few months to see how events unfold. So thank you for your attention. And our goal is now to have lots of time for questions and discussion. I think we're planning to keep the line open uh, up until 8.30 or so, uh, so we can have a vigorous discussion. Uh, my colleague, Scott Podolsky, uh, will field the questions uh, and we will do our best to respond to everyone who has something to submit. Thank you very much for your attention. I get to be the clapper. As always, David, I've been learning from you for well over 25 years and, and thank you so much. There's, there's a reason you're the first two time SD's uh, lecturer and, and we're all beneficiary tonight, so, so, so thank you. Um, to everyone in the audience, yes, please use the, the Q&A function at the, at the bottom of the screen to submit your questions and I'll get to screen those and, 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 and throw them in, in David's direction. And while you're all thinking of your questions, uh, David, I'll, I'll throw you one that, so far, I, I, I direct the Center for the History of Medicine at the Countway. As you look around, apart from emails between you and Mark Lipsitch, what should we be saving and prioritizing so that people can learn from this current pandemic 50 years from now, 100 years from now? I think that's an incredibly difficult uh, problem. The, like many people, I am teaching a course this fall on COVID. I'm teaching a course, Alan Branch is teaching a course. I'm sure there are many COVID courses being taught throughout the country. And so all spring and summer, I've just been trying to keep everything that's interesting and it's just completely impossible to keep up. Uh, even if you just wanted to focus narrowly on what historians of medicine are writing, I mean, every time you turn around, there's a new collection of articles. People have been incredibly engaged, publishing in scholarly journals, doing blogs in scholarly journals. Uh, many of my colleagues at Harvard, especially Joel Lepore and Stephen Greenblatt, have been churning out a series of articles in the New Yorker. And so there's this, um, this amazing output, uh, let alone you know, the media coverage, print media, broadcast media, blogs, I think it'll be impossible to, to compile all of this into a useful archive of this epidemic because there's just too much stuff. Uh, much of it is taking place digitally uh, and trying to figure out how to store this ephemera, I think it is a really real, is a huge challenge. Uh, many people are trying. There've been various oral history collections that people have already organized. There are several repositories that already exist, but this will certainly be the best documented epidemic ever. And I suspect historians will be kept busy uh, well after uh, we have passed on. Thanks. So uh, people are, the questions are already coming in. So the first question gets at the, at the humility that you exhibited tonight and, and that we all have experienced, saying that the, the dramaturgy of an epidemic is an interesting concept, but it seems necessar necessarily retrospective. What can be done prospectively when many potential pandemics do end up being false alarms? Which is where you said you, you were in March. Yeah. So, so you know, in January, uh, as a one-time historian of epidemics, I was certainly paying a bit of attention to these news reports from COVID, thinking that in an earlier phase of my career, I would have been all over this and would have been totally fascinated, but my research had moved on. And so I was much like the narrator, Dr. Ryu uh, in Camus, who like, I saw the rat on my doorstop and I kicked it out of the way and went on with business as usual. Uh, and if someone like me, who is so familiar with Rosenberg's article and this notion that people respond to epidemics with denial, then responded to an epidemic with denial. How can there be hope for any of us to notice these things? Uh, and yes, it, it is a problem, you know, the false alarm, you know, the, the, the sheep who cried wolf. Uh, there, some of you may be aware of these details, but when WHO declared a flu pandemic in 2009, uh, that triggered a, a bitter controversy <clears throat> because it turns out many of the people who were on the secret committee that had the power to declare a flu pandemic had financial relationships to the pharmaceutical industry. And the way global health regulations and preparedness plans were structured, the minute WHO declares a flu pandemic, all sorts of automated purchasing orders are activated. So when, when WHO declares a flu pandemic, the US purchases billions of dollars of Tamiflu. And 
part of the one of the people who had put this system into place was Donald Rumsfeld, who before becoming Secretary of Defense had been a senior, senior executive at Roche Pharmaceuticals, who owns Tamiflu. And so there was all this, all these reports coming out in 2009 about the very crooked relationships between the WHO and the pharmaceutical industry and governments that would make you suspicious of anyone who ever declared a pandemic. Uh, well, you know, we got burned. You know, there, there had been false alarms in 2006 and 2009, and this one was not a false alarm. Uh, was there any reason we could have known that this would be much worse than SARS? I don't think so. You know, there'd been two significant lethal coronaviruses, SARS and MERS. Neither of them has killed more than a thousand people. Uh, this one is now soon to hit a million uh, or kill a million people, and I assume it will be several million before it's finished. Uh, I don't know what we could do differently uh, to be able to detect which ones are the false alarms and which ones are the real ones. Yeah, oh. uh, we're similarly humbled. Um, this is interesting. Th thanks so much for the great talk. In the past, has the response in this country or other countries been so politicized and especially along political party lines as today? Yeah, as I said, and if, if, for those of you who, who can access it, uh, the article by Martin Pernick about the yellow fever epidemic in 1793 is one of my favorite articles in the history of medicine. Uh, the short story of that, if I can get the details right off the top of my head, uh, was that the Capitol was still in Philadelphia, it hadn't yet moved to Washington, D.C. There was an outbreak of yellow fever, which happened periodically in cities as far north as Philadelphia. Uh, and the big issue was, should you implement a quarantine, especially on trade coming in from the West Indies, especially from French colonies, what's now Haiti and the Dominican Republic, uh, which were major producers of sugar, which is a huge commodity uh, for early America. And people who supported free trade with France, people who were Jefferson's allies, uh, tended to argue that yellow fever was an environmental disease uh, that emerged from the swamps that surrounded Philadelphia, that quarantine would be useless and we should uh, keep free trade going. Of course, as I say, say this, I'm afraid I'm reversing the political parties. But anyway, so one, one argument was that it was an environmental disease. There was no need for quarantine, uh, no need to try to bar French ships from coming in. The other argument was that it was a contagious disease. We needed to be very careful. We should put trade barriers in place. Uh, and since this split essentially on the lines between Jefferson and Hamilton, were you a supporter of the British or were you a supporter of the French? Uh, and it became really the first significant fight of the two party system. Uh, and you can see this playing out decade after decade after decade. The other image I had showed in my slide was an article by Judy Levitt about a smallpox epidemic in Milwaukee in the late 19th century uh, that triggered a, a huge fight between basically two generations of immigrant communities. There had been a German immigration that was now well established in the city and had the political and public health power. And there had been a more recent immigration of immigrants from Eastern Europe. Uh, and there was a lot of tension between the German and the Eastern immigrants, Eastern European immigrants. And again, it became a huge political fight. Uh, and the protesters ended up burning an effigy of the public health commissioner. Uh, mm -hmm. That hasn't happened to Tony Fauci yet. Uh, so maybe things are actually cooler than they have been in the past. But yes, this politicization uh, is as old, if not older, than the country itself. Perhaps, right, just a new degree, certainly, today. One question is, has testing played a significant role in any past epidemics? And I guess this gets at the deeper history of, of contact tracing and testing in general and these other ways to, as you say, sh shape the course of an epidemic. <laughs> So it raises an interesting question. When, when did the first diagnostic tests appear? And Scott, you may have a more accurate answer to this than I do. You know, one of the old questions that had come up in the 19th century is once a case had been recognized on clinical grounds, should you then have compulsory reporting? So there were, there were strong arguments about compulsory reporting of tuberculosis, at least back into the 1890s. And for disease like smallpox, you didn't really need testing because the disease itself was so characteristic and any person would have recognized a typical case of smallpox. The first epidemic that I'm aware of, and here I'm channeling Alan Brandt, for which testing played a huge role, was the AIDS epidemic in the 1980s, uh, in part because of a peculiar characteristic of HIV, which was a very long latency, at least in Americans, a different situation in Sub-Saharan Africa. But the typical American who is healthy at baseline could go several years after being infected with HIV before showing significant symptoms. 
And so the, when the diagnostic test was developed in 1985, that was completely transformative for the epidemic itself because it created an opportunity to detect people who were HIV positive and not yet showing symptoms. And I assume the epidemic would have played out in radically different ways had that test not been developed. Uh, as far as I can tell, that test worked really well. I don't remember, I, mean, I was just in high school at the time, but I don't remember there being huge problems with false negatives, false positives, inadequate testing capacity. I would have assumed that 30 years later, our testing prowess would be even better than it was in 1985. But testing in COVID has not been as successful or decisive as testing was for HIV. Right, I know in just investment in surveillance, whether it be for this or for antimicrobial resistance, along similar lines, pointed to the lack of investment in, in public health. Um, Oops, I lost the, yes. This gets at the, the, the overall many events of the 2020 and, and, and what we would like to see happen moving forward. And this, as we know from previous pandemics that pandemics affect marginalized racial populations disproportionately. What are some structural racism interventions on a population health level that we ought to consider as we reflect on the lessons from previous pandemics and the current one? But the, the simple answer is, uh, you know, we, we need to have a more egalitarian society that doesn't have the highest levels of income inequality than we've had since the 1920s uh, that left so many people vulnerable. And in the case, in the case of COVID, it was just sort of a, multi, a multi-hit problem. So you had people who were living in crowded urban housing uh, because of poverty, also often in multi-generational households, uh, which has been a liability, uh, who were working in jobs that were de deemed essential, who had to continue their exposure in the case of New York, who often relied on public transportation. Uh, so it, it's not surprising given the way that New York is structured that there were a lot of people in crowded housing who relied on the subway who had to work despite the epidemic. And that was the population that has been hit so hard by the epidemic. There was recently an analysis uh, that came out of the Harvard School of Public Health uh, offering more nuance. They, they looked very carefully at the experience of African-American populations on one hand, and Latino populations on the other to show that even though both were poor and discriminated against communities, the specific risk factors were actually quite different in those two populations. And so there's not no one size fits all approach. Alleviating poverty would go a very, very long way. Uh, you know, more pragmatically, what could you do? Uh, I think a lot of people wish in retrospect that we had had PPE on hand to push out to people in these essential jobs very, very early on. And if masks had been universally available in mid-February, mid there are some estimates that two-thirds of the deaths would have been prevented. <clears throat> now, why weren't there masks? Uh, and this is a case where you can blame, put blame on both political parties. Uh, you know, I might bungle these numbers off the top of my head. I have them written in something that I published through the Harvard Safra Center. But if, if I remember correctly, at the end of the Bush Jr. administration in 2008, the national stockpile had 100 million masks stockpiled in preparation for a pandemic, 100 million masks. A lot of those were dispensed in 2009 during the flu pandemic scare, and the Obama administration did not restock the stockpile. So when Obama left office, the stockpile was down to 10 million masks, down from 100 million, and then the Trump administration didn't increase it either. Uh, had we had 100 million masks in February, things might have played out differently. So sometimes it's simple things. Masks are not an expensive intervention. Other, other times it's a much more complicated intervention, you know, creating a more egalitarian society. Here's a question again, like many of them, this question starts off saying, wonderful talk, but it's easy to agree. Um, and this derives a little bit from the politicization question, but it says, does social media or do social media and conspiracy theories pose a new and unique problem with respect to a pandemic? Acknowledging the advent of technology, what, what, what is new in this moment in that respect? <clears throat> Media theorists are of two camps about this, as, as people often are uh, in these sorts of situations. Uh, on the one hand, yes, social media is t completely different. You know, news can spread on a global scale essentially instantaneously in a way that it couldn't happen before. Uh, there's a very low barrier to entry, so anyone can post something and there's a chance that it will go viral. Uh, and this can be used as a force of either uh, a force of evil and some of these conspiracy theories that I think have blood on their hands for convincing people this is actually a hoax. But it's also been used as a force for good. The New York Times had a great video last week 
showing how other countries have made effective use of social media for public health education. And it, it, it led with a terrific uh, TikTok video, I forgot whether it was from South Korea or Vietnam, but it had two pop stars who were doing a song and dance about hand washing. Uh, mm -hmm. And so that's the case, and it has a totally catchy melody. So that's a case where you can use these things very well. And so yes, that's new. But historians of media have said, well, sure, the pace is a little bit different, but fundamentally, a lot of these measures were in place. So it, for the local history, I mean, there was a smallpox epidemic in Boston, 1900 to 1904, more or less. And that was a time where there were multiple newspapers published in Boston. Some of them went through multiple editions a day. And yes, it's not instantaneous dissemination, but there was an incredibly rapid news cycle. There were all sorts of conspiracy theories. The media was incredibly politicized. There were some newspapers that were pro-public health. There were some newspapers uh, that were distrustful of the authorities. There were ethnic newspapers produced by the neighborhoods in the North End and South Boston. So many of the things that we think are so characteristic of our moment now uh, have antecedents that are different, but strikingly similar to the state. You can even go back in Boston to 1721, when there was a famous smallpox epidemic uh, that led to a fight between Cotton Mather and William Douglas about the value of inoculation for smallpox. And again, each of them was supported by a different collection of broadsides and newsletters, which are again pu published multiple times. And so it's a gift for historians because you can follow this epidemic and its discussions, not hour by hour, but certainly week by week as these, the protagonists in the debate and their supportive media outlets published very, very actively. So we really do want to save our tweets and, and, and all that for, for the future historians, <laughs> sure. Uh, I really like this question. I, I mean, I like all these questions, but are there historical precedents for other social movements to surge during a pandemic in the way that the Black Lives Matter anti-police brutality protests took off this spring? Do these types of movements typically follow health crises? And if so, how do we explain that? That's an excellent question, and I can't give a fully informed answer to that. Uh, one example, and you know, which came first is an interesting question, but there was a dramatic relationship between the HIV epidemic in the 1980s and the uh, gay rights movements that had started well before the epidemic in the late 60s, early 70s. Uh, but the epidemic itself was a trans transformational moment uh, for people for advocates of gay rights. So that kind of thing certainly happened. Many past epidemics have exacerbated ethnic unrest. Uh, I mentioned the Milwaukee epidemic of smallpox in the 1880s, 1890s, which posed German immigrants against Eastern European immigrants. Uh, the smallpox epidemic in Boston in 1902 posed the white establishment against the Irish and Italian uh, populations in the North End and South Boston. Uh, now, I don't think there was a, an equivalent to the Irish Lives Matter or the Italian Lives Matter. So I don't think anything like that happened, but that could just be that I don't know Boston history well enough to be able to give a full answer to that question. One thing yeah. I think that does happen is that, you know, epidemics, as Rosenberg had described, put societies under stress. Uh, and in that stress, all sorts of tensions rise to the surface. You know, you can see this with plague and smallpox in San Francisco. Uh, which led to a real race, race reckoning about Chinese immigrants in that city. Yeah. No, I, when I think about what 2020 will be remembered for, whether it be for COVID-19 or, or for uh, or racial reckoning, uh, it makes me think back to 1968, 1969, there was a massive flu pandemic that year. And, and I would love to somebody to go back and look at that micro detail to see whether there's any relationship between civil, civil rights and racial unrest at that time and reckoning with the flu pandemic. I, I have no idea. I mean, I think it's a, paper that could, could certainly be worked on and written. So excellent question, thank you. Um, someone wanted to know, um, you know, here we are in September, looking at school closings in 1918 and school closings today, and you know, a sense of debate at the time around school closings and the losses that, that, that would ensue with that? So the school closings were debated, they, they weren't implemented as widely as they are now. Uh, but there, there was a very good article, I forget where I saw this, whether it was, about the, what Harvard had done, was because I was curious, I was looking for this and found it right away. I don't remember what was published in the Harvard Crimson or one of the various Harvard magazines, uh, but Harvard considered closing down in, in fall of 1918, but stayed open. Uh, the campus was slightly depopulated anyway because of the war. Uh, if you can go through, there's a terrific database for anyone who's interested, produced at the University of Michigan. Uh, and 
scholars led by uh, Alexander Stern and Har Howard Markell between 2005 and 2010 basically collected everything they could get their hands on from newspapers and put it all in this terrific archive at the Univer University of Michigan. And if you just Google University of Michigan flu archive, it comes right up. Uh, and they look at the at 50 different cities uh, and have a very good essay about how each of these different cities responded and the impact that had. And you can see which ones had school closures, which ones did not. Um, school closures uh, have happened in other epidemics. You know, polio was mostly a summer virus, so that wasn't a huge issue there. Uh, but this isn't the first time there have been school closures, but I don't think there's any, been anything this extensive uh, on a global scale in the, in the past. Right. Yeah, certainly for our audience members, if you Google um, Encyclopedia of Influenza, University of Michigan, it, it is a fantastic resource. David, you've been super generous in, in sitting here and answering these questions. I'll ask you just a few more. People are eager to hear from you. Um, this one relates to the school closures and downstream effects, or perhaps not. How can it be that the present US educational system so failed to create a science informed population capable of understanding the importance of social distancing and mass production, mass protection or production? Yeah, and, and, and uh, it, it, it is a, a mind boggling situation that we're in. Uh, and it's not at all unique to influenza. My colleague Naomi Oreskes would say, how is it that we have created a population that has such poor understanding of climate science that President Trump can go to California in the midst of the worst forest fire season they've ever had and claim that science, scientists don't really know what's going on. Uh, and many people will follow his lead on that. Um, I don't know, I mean, I'm not a historian of public education. I can't explain uh, all the reasons that have contributed to that. Um, one is clearly a case of you know, funding. There are huge disparities in funding for public education between different states, different cities that have always created problems of school quality. Uh, some is an issue of, of leadership for a variety of reasons over the past generation. The Republican Party or members of the Republican Party have found political gain uh, by casting experts as the boogeyman uh, who are trying to take away your rights and your liberties. And that has been exacerbated by Trump, but it's not unique to Trump. Uh, and that creates an enormous amount of skepticism. And you see this in both climate change and with flu. There's obviously a, there's a line somewhere between what's conspiracy theory versus what's true, but there, there has often been industry interest behind some of these things. Uh, Alan Brandt has exhaustively shown in Cigarette Century the ways in which the tobacco industry created a, a bogus controversy about the health effects of smoking. Naomi Oreskes has documented often that it was the same law firms and the same public relation companies that the tobacco industry used have now worked with the fossil fuel industry to create a false controversy about uh, climate change. I don't think anyone has yet suggested that there is some industry interest behind the influenza hoax situation. Uh, there have been claims, again, if you read right-wing media or watch Fox News or, or, or AON, that this whole thing is a hoax created by the pharmaceutical industry to drive vaccines. Uh, I don't think the pharmaceutical industry is actually doing that. Uh, no one can go into their archives, so maybe they'll surprise us someday. Uh, <laughs> but the, it's a case of imperfect education systems exacerbated by uh, a political movement that has led to a war on expertise. And some of it is also self-inflicted wounds. Uh, I think one of the big regrets amongst Tony Fauci and others in the public health leadership is they had soft peddled the value of masks in February. Now this was a strategic decision. Uh, they were concerned that if they said everyone should wear masks, we would then exhaust the national supply and the people who needed them most wouldn't be able to get them. And so they very actively said through February into March, the typical people don't need to wear masks. When they then changed course on that later in the spring, they didn't have a lot of credibility left on that issue anymore. And so masks, uh, which I don't think need to have become a politicized issue that they are, have become wildly politicized. Uh, and you, you see articles, op-eds published every day saying the, the, the simplest thing we could do to get this epidemic under control is wear masks. Why is it that not wearing masks is a higher value for people than allowing our children to get to school? Uh, 
but unfortunately that's the situation that we're in now. Uh, one of my concerns as a parent of two school age kids or high school age kids uh, is this ep epidemic is making the public education system worse because there's now a generation of kids who have lost many, many months of effective education. Uh, and so I don't know how we're going to dig ourselves out of that hole. All right, the, um, I'll ask one more. A number of questions coming in around, around vaccines. Um, and I'll, I'll just consolidate that into a single question. If I, I have patients coming into my office now saying, as a primary care physician saying, when the vaccine comes out, should I, should I take it? So let's say the vaccine is announced in October or November. Should I, should I, should I jump in line? What, what forces are at stake in that, in that discussion? Yeah, and this is a case like, like the mask issue, but on steroids where something that should be a relatively simple scientific public health question have now been grotesquely politicized in a way that even people like Scott and me who should know a lot about this will have genuinely doubt, will have genuine doubt about what to make of any of this. So if the FDA announces before the election that we have this wonderful new vaccine that everyone should take, I would have a very hard time taking that seriously uh, since it's quite clear that the Trump administration is committed to getting the vaccine out before election day uh, and is willing to cut corners and doesn't seem impressed by the usual rules of scientific evidence. Uh, and the fact that a consortium of pharmaceutical company leaders needed to issue a public statement saying, we're not gonna go there prematurely. Like the fact that the industry is trying to slow the pace of, or not slow the pace, uh, downplay the promissory claims. Uh, when normally you'd expect them to be hyping it up. Uh, suggests that there really is something unusual going on. Uh, if the industry leaders are trying to lower expectations, uh, and whatever company brings a compellingly safe and effective vaccine to market first has tr tremendous financial upside to doing that. Uh, but the fact that they're being very cautious, uh, I guess is reassuring, but it, sh it shows how e everything that gets done with the vaccine will be interpreted by most people through this lens of what are the political interests of the Trump administration and the FDA? What are the financial interests of this industry? So, you know, if a vaccine is announced on October 31st, uh, I think there are a lot of people who would be enormously skeptical of it. Hopefully that would be done in such a way that they would release evidence that would make, it a, make a compelling case that this wasn't an October surprise by the Trump administration to try to win points before the election. Uh, I think they would have a, they would face a mountain of skepticism. Now, suppose the vaccine comes out January 1st, uh, where there's no suggestion of political meddling or electioneering behind it. Uh, should we rush to get in line? It's really hard to know. Obviously, you know, famously, people lined up in droves for the polio vaccine uh, in the 1950s when it became available. That was mostly a success story. Uh, there, there was the notorious episode of the Cutter incident, the Cutter incident in which one of the pharmaceutical manufacturing firms had a contaminated batch of vaccine. And I think it was roughly 200 children died from the vaccine itself, which caused active polio. <laughs> the trouble with the vaccines, and, and this is even in the best unpoliticized case of vaccines, is a lot of vaccines cause bad side effects at low rates, one in 10,000, one in 100,000, one in a million. And those are usually pretty good odds. Like if someone said, uh, I wanna give you $1,000 and if I do, one in 10,000 chance that something bad might happen to you, most people would jump at that. It's terrific odds. But if you have a vaccine that causes a bad side effect one in 10,000 times and you give it to 7 billion people, that's a lot of people who are gonna be harmed by that vaccine. The problem is you can't detect a one in 10,000 or a one in 100,000 side effect until you have given a vaccine to tens or hundreds of thousands or even millions of people. So it's inevitable that when the first vaccines are released, there will be uncertainty about their safety. You can only get comprehensive knowledge of safety after these have been widely deployed in many, many people for many, many years. And we're not gonna have that. Someone's gonna have to go first. Uh, lots of people are gonna have to go first, uh, taking a vaccine that hasn't been fully vetted. Now, anti-vaccination sentiment uh, 
in this country goes back to the 1721 inoculation controversy. Uh, there were furious fights in Boston in 1900, which led to a Supreme Court decision, Jacobson v. Massachusetts, which is now the basis for most public health power in this country. Uh, there's a terrific book for anyone who's interested in this by a historian, Karen Wallach, called The Anti-Vaccine Heresy, uh, about the anti-vaccination campaigns in Boston and Cambridge that gave rise to the Supreme Court case. And she paints a very sympathetic portrait of the anti-vaxxers in the 1890s. The vaccines that were used then were often produced by unregulated pharmaceutical companies. Uh, there were all sorts of things that would go wrong. And they, they, was, they were produced in animals. They often used partially attenuated strains. There were cases of people getting syphilis or tetanus from the smallpox vaccine because the batches were contaminated. These were dangerous vaccines. Uh, and people's safety concerns were completely legitimate. But then there were also the familiar uh, civil liberty concerns. People felt like there, there was no reason that they should have to submit themselves to the will of this government. Why would you trust these government experts? So there's an aspect of that rhetoric that is very familiar to us today. The vaccine industry now, again, even though we won't have comprehensive evidence, is radically different than it was in the 1890s. Uh, it's regulated. Uh, many of these companies have robust manufacturing prowess. They're not going to contaminate the vaccines with syphilis or tetanus or the things that used to happen in the past. And meanwhile, most of the vaccines that are being developed are not using live virus or attenuated virus. They're based on isolated proteins or isolated RNA sequences that are produced synthetically or in tightly controlled manufacturing conditions. And so just on the basis of first principles, the vaccine candidates being produced should be orders of magnitude safer than traditional vaccines. But safer doesn't mean perfectly safe. Uh, there was a recent concern in, in England uh, with the Oxford vaccine of a patient who developed transverse myelitis. Was that caused by the vaccine? That's an incredibly difficult question for researchers to sort out. They're re they are reassured enough that they have resumed testing of that vaccine. Uh, and so it's just going to have to be a leap of faith. Uh, I am, since I'm not currently doing active clinical work, I won't be in that first priority group. Scott probably will be. Uh, so Scott will face this decision before I do. I was looking at the, the rationing scheme. I'm, I'm likely not going to get the vaccine until the summer. Uh, uh, so Scott will be probably in that first crowd in January. Uh, and I suspect, I mean, you could make a case that physicians will have a professional obligation. Uh, if physicians have bought into the promise of biomedical science and are supposed to have faith in the pharmaceutical industry since we prescribe so many pharmaceuticals for our patients. And so if a vaccine is produced by a reputable company and authorized by the FDA on the basis of phase three clinical trials, uh, and there's no reason to suspect this is political interference by the Trump or possible future Biden administrations, uh, I think that most healthcare professionals have an obligation to get in that line and accept the vaccine, and I probably would do so myself. Uh, I would be nervous. Uh, it's a new vaccine. Uh, but I think it would be important for anyone who is even considering to get a vaccine to get a vaccine to demonstrate you know, solidarity. That, that vaccine is our best way out of this crisis. Uh, and even if there's a risk, I think it's a worth, risk worth taking to get out of this crisis. Um, and given what percentage of the population is just not going to get vaccinated at all, I think anyone who's considering it, uh, along with the people who are definitely eager to get it, really should do it because that's the best hope that the vaccine will be effective. Well, David, thank you. Um, as you said, this has all been very humbling. There's been an enormous amount of information over the past six months. And you, with your usual due humility, yet with total brilliance, have, as synthesize and analyze this enormity of information to really frame where we've been, where we may be heading, and just enormously grateful to you. Um, uh, David, thank you so much again. Uh, really grateful to you. I'll let you know how the vaccine goes. Um, <laughs>